Now turn with me please to Titus and chapter 2. I'm going to just pick up one verse in Titus chapter 2 and then we're going to look at five other passages but because Zoom is difficult to concentrate on and there's so much going on in your own home and uh, many distractions I'm going to just look at the scriptures as we progress so that we'll keep our Bibles handy and hopefully we'll be able to uh, concentrate on the theme of what we're trying to say. So Titus chapter 2, uh, just for one verse by way of introduction, he, uh, the writer Paul is speaking to servants there in verse 9 and he says in verse 10, not purloining but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. We'll just leave it there for now and trust God's blessing to be on that verse and also on the other verses that we will read. It was uh, my privilege recently to be in Trafalgar Square with our brother Jonathan Black when we were in London. And uh, I was reminded that October the 21st, 1805, just before the Battle of Trafalgar, Viscount Nelson sent a signal out from HMS Victory, the boat upon which he was. The battle in which he was about to engage, the Battle of Trafalgar, after which Trafalgar Square is named, was the decisive naval engagement in the Napoleonic Wars. And as a result of it, Britain gained control of the seas and avoided a French invasion. I do believe Britain is also trying to gain control of the seas once more, but that's another story. Nelson died in that battle. The battle was victorious for the British and in between his death and the victory and all that it meant, the signal that he came, that, that he gave just before the battle became embedded in the minds of English people even unto this day. The signal that he gave to his troops, his navy, was this. England expects that every man will do his duty. England expects that every man will do his duty. I want to call this message tonight, not England expects, but the Bible expects. And I want to take as my theme for this meeting, the uniform message of the New Testament in particular, that what I profess to believe must be reflected in how I live. The Bible expects that to be so. In other words, the Bible expects that doctrine must be reflected in duty. The Bible expects that belief must be reflected in behavior. The Bible expects that faith must be evidenced in works. We would talk about in modern parlance, there's no point talking the talk unless we walk the walk. The Lord Jesus summed it up in Matthew 23 when he spoke of the Pharisees like this, they say and do not. So they're happy to speak what they believe, but actually they obviously didn't really believe it at all because they didn't practice it. So just want to make sure we've got this uh, framework before we move forward. When, I, when I'm talking about doctrine, I'm thinking of the doctrine of the gospel, the teaching of the New Testament, everything that's contained within the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's doctrine, teaching. Now, the Bible is telling us that doctrine doesn't just sit on its own in a corner, never bothering anybody. It's just some sort of cerebral thing that you uh, learn in a, in a classroom, tuck it in your back pocket and you go your way. No, the doctrine that I believe must match, must complement, must be balanced by the practice of my life. What I believe, how I live. And the theme of what I'm trying to convey to you tonight is that these two categories of things Doctrine and practice, what I believe and how I live, must ever and always be united, must never be divorced. And if there 
is no link in my life between what I believe and how I live, if that link is broken, or if how I live totally contradicts what I say I believe, then that puts my whole profession into question. But not only is what I believe and what I practice supposed to be linked, they are complementary one toward another. So belief generates behavior, but in turn that behavior manifests that belief. It becomes the showcase of my belief. Doctrine generates duty, but in turn the duties that I perform manifest the doctrine that I believe. Faith generates works, but then those works manifest that faith. Now in this verse here, we've not only discovering there's that complementarian nature between faith and works, we're actually learning here that not only does my life manifest what I believe, it adorns what I believe. Did you notice the verse there, verse 10, that we should adorn the doctrine? That word adorn, it's, it's a very obvious word to us even in English. It's, it's a Greek word cosmeo, a verb, cosmeo, from which we get cosmetics. When, when a person adorns themselves, not necessarily in cosmetics, but just even putting on a jacket or, or, or a dress or whatever, when you adorn yourselves, what you are doing is you're beautifying your body, trying to. That's another subject. But here in this verse, what we're learning is this, that the Christian's life beautifies the faith. The Christian's life adorns the gospel. You see, your life is the only gospel that a lot of people will ever read. You go into your office, you go into your school, you live in your street. Your life can have the function of adorning the gospel, making the gospel look good, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. It reminds me of what the Lord said in, in Matthew 5, 16. He said, let your light so shine before men. Let, let the, the light of the gospel within your soul, let your Christian life so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see what the, what the writer is saying there is this, as people see a gospel-shaped life, that life adorns the gospel. It makes the gospel attractive. And so it has ever been. Can you imagine how good the gospel looked in Jericho when Zacchaeus got saved? No longer was he a rascal. No longer was he a thief. No longer was he an extortioner. They could actually look at him and say, what happened to that man? The gospel happened to him. His life adorned the gospel. And just trace it all the way through the New Testament, the Philippian jailer, you name it, the Apostle Paul, there they all are. Take Corinth. I've never been to Corinth. I'd love to go there one day. But I'm told that ancient Corinth was an extremely wicked place. It was a cosmopolitan place, a lot of traffic, a lot of coming and going, a typical place where sin thrives. The people of Corinth were described in a long list of ugly sins by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6. I'll read it for you. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, Drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Now listen what he says. And such were some of you. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified and so on. People could look at the assembly in Corinth and say, what do these people believe? Because their life adorned the gospel. The best advert for the truth of the gospel is a transformed Christian life. The worst advert for the truth of the gospel is for some big pr preacher or pastor to have a public fall from grace. And then all the atheists can just point the finger and say, well, you see, that just shows you it's all a waste of time. Now, there are five New Testament epistles that build their structure around this one point. 
this theme of my message this evening, that the Bible expects that faith will be manifested in works, that what I believe will be manifested in how I live. Now, it's there in the words of Christ. It's there in all the epistles almost of Paul and Peter and so on. But there are five epistles in particular which hammer home this theme. So just briefly, let me run through the headings and then you'll know where I'm going for the next uh, 40 minutes or so or half an hour, whatever it is. So the five epistles that you see listed there take this theme. They take it all in a slightly different way, but ultimately they're getting at the same thing, that the Bible expects this link between lip and life between what I profess, what I believe, what I say is in my head, and what's on my feet on the street, as it were. So Romans will put it like this. Justification must lead to sanctification. Ephesians will put it like this. Grace will always lead to godliness in a person's life. Titus will put it like this. Doctrine, the truth of the gospel, will lead to Christian duty. The epistle of James, same thing, slightly different twist. Faith must and always will lead to good works. And finally, the first epistle of John. So clearly that epistle is making the point. The new birth must lead to new behavior. Can you see? It's the same thing. It's the same idea. It's the same concept but given to us by five different epistles from five different angles. But can you see how central this theme is to the whole of the Bible, to the whole of the doctrine that is before us? So come with me to Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter six. We're going to look at these five passages of scripture and follow this theme as we go. Romans chapter six, please. I don't know whether you've ever met a person who uh, you had a discussion with them about eternal security. And by that, I mean the Bible teaching that once you're saved, you can never be lost. Once you're justified, you can never be unjustified. Maybe a Pentecostal, maybe a Roman Catholic, maybe a Jehovah's Witness, also even a Muslim. And you present this to them. And quite often an objection comes up like this. Well, if I believe that, if I believe that... All my sins, past, present and future, they're all forgiven. Well, then I can live as I like. Then I can do as I please. That can't be right. So that, that's how they approach eternal security. Well, the Apostle Paul tackles that exact objection in Romans chapter 6. You say, why does he do it in chapter 6? Well, he does it in chapter 6 because... In the first five chapters of Romans, he's been outlining the way of salvation. So he outlines the guilt of the whole world. Jews and Gentiles were all guilty. Then he brings in God's way of salvation. What is God's way of salvation? God's way of salvation is to provide the Lord Jesus to be the propitiation, to be the sacrifice that satisfies his eternal righteousness. And there at the cross, Every charge against sin is answered by Christ. Now, if a sinner will trust in Christ, then righteousness, a right standing before God, can be imputed to him, even though he doesn't deserve it, even though it doesn't make him personally righteous. Nevertheless, he stands as righteous in the sight of God. He's in Christ. He is justified. So all sin, past, present and future, all absolutely and completely gone. Before the eye of God, he is now righteous. Paul is all the time while he's saying that thinking, <laughs> somebody out there is thinking to himself, well, if that's the case, then it doesn't matter how I live. And so here he comes to chapter six and verse one. Look what he says. What shall we say then? What shall we say in light of the fact that you can be completely forgiven and justified from everything? Shall we now continue in sin that grace may abound? So what he's about to do in chapters six and seven and eight is explain 
that the scheme of justification that God has designed doesn't lead men to sin. Rather, it leads them to holiness. Another word for sanctification. Holiness and sanctification is the same word in the Greek. So have you got this now? The first five chapters of Romans, how sinners are justified. Then the next three chapters, six, seven and eight, how justified sinners can live holy lives. They're linked. They cannot be divorced. Justification leads to sanctification. In the first five chapters, we have that positional righteousness. And then in the next three chapters, that practical righteousness, that practical sanctification. You say, well, how does it work? Next time I meet one of these people, how do I explain it? Well, what you need to understand is in the first five chapters, Paul is stating the fact that Christ died for me. That's the basis of my justification. He died for me. He has, through his blood, given to God a ransom for my sins. But then in the next three chapters, to argue this point that that doesn't mean you can live as you like, Paul changes from Christ died for me to I died with Christ. Now, both of these things were true of me the moment I got saved. But what these chapters are saying is this, that Calvary wasn't just an end of my sins, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Calvary was an end of myself. Look at verse six, knowing this, our old man, our old self, what I was in Adam is crucified with Christ. The argument of the chapter is this. You and I entered the world as babies. We entered the world as slaves of sin. Sin was on the throne of our life. He had mastery over us and that by right. We were under its tyranny. But at the cross. Christ died to sin. And I have died to sin in my association with Christ. So he died to the claims of sin and I have died to the claim of sin. And a slave's owner loses power over him when the slave dies. And my relationship, says Paul in chapter six, seven and eight. I know this is difficult, but there's not an easy way of explaining this. But your relationship and my relationship to sin as a master terminated the moment I was saved through my death. I died with Christ. I'm no longer linked to sin as a tyrannical master. Verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over me. I have a new master. Verse 22, God is my master. So he says in verse 11, the key to victory over sin is this. Reckon this to be so. Sin is not your master and cannot be your master. You say, well, sometimes it feels like it. Yes, well, he wants to get back on the throne. He wants to cause you as much difficulty as he can, but he doesn't have the legal right to do so. He has been dethroned. You have died to sin. God is your master. And reckoning that to be so and understanding that that is so, live unto righteousness so can you see that far from justification being a license to sin it brings me into this new position of having died to sin and now being alive unto god so not only has my sin been cleared myself has been crucified and now i have the power to live because god has put his holy spirit in me i have the power to live a sanctified life so are you justified? I'm not sure where you're listening from, maybe in even another country. Are you justified? Well, then, if you claim to be justified, are you living a sanctified life? In your home, in your school, in your office, on your phone, in your media absorption, is there a disconnect? between the fact that you claim I'm saved, once saved, always saved, and I'm, I'm completely right with God, is that being manifested in that sanctified life? The Bible expects 
justification will lead to sanctification. Now, come with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four. We're moving to point number two. Now, I, 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 I was reluctant to do five points. I get the feeling that once I get to about number four, you're going to be wanting to put the kettle on. So I'm going to try my best to keep you hanging on for these five points. Ephesians, please, and chapter four. Ephesians is a book of two halves. It's very handy because it's six chapters, so we can divide it exactly three and three. The first three chapters of Ephesians are doctrinal. Don't you just love doctrine? You say, no, I don't. Well, you have to have doctrine before you can have practice. Because the last three chapters are practical, but they're built on the doctrinal because there's a link, remember? The first three chapters is my wealth in Christ, all that I have in him. And the next three chapters is my walk and my warfare, which flows from those first three chapters. The first three chapters is my position in Christ. And the next three chapters is my practice in the Lord. One of the hardest chapters in the Bible to understand is Ephesians chapter one. Maybe not understand is the word. Maybe just it's so big. It's so deep. It's just hard to wrap your head. Even if you can seemingly understand what it's saying, it's just it's just such a massive, massive chapter as it outlines for us. And then running into the other chapters, what I have in Christ, it calls it every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies we've been made accepted we've been made alive we've been brought near we've been made fellow members of the same body with the jews all of this has been done for us by grace absolutely freely for a god who's rich in mercy now look at verse one of chapter four i therefore as the prisoner of the lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. He's about to do that job of linking doctrine to practice. That's what the word therefore means. He says, I've said all this. I've proved all this. I've laid it all out. All the things that you have, therefore, walk worthy. Walk worthy worthy you say what does it mean to walk worthy well you may well ask it's a difficult expression the word worthy if you've been in an assembly for a while and you hear the letters of commendation read out on a lord's day morning at the bottom it will often say this receive them in the lord as becometh saints that word becometh is the same as this word worthy it's an adverb in other words receive them in the lord as is worthy of people who say they're saints the, 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 the root meaning of, of this word uh, worthy is to bring up the other side of the scales. Now, I'm, I'm 56. When I was young, when I was a child, it was in the 1960s. Some of you won't remember them. Some of you will. Some of you could probably take you back to the 40s or even earlier. But the 60s was my childhood. And in the 1960s, there were no supermarkets. And Monday morning was shopping. Back in those days, we did the same thing the same day every week. And uh, Monday morning, we started off in Chapel Street. And there we went into the baker and got the bread. We crossed the road to the butcher and we got the meat. There were still hanging up pigs from the ceilings in those days. And then we went to the grocer. The other end of the, his name was R.V. Jones. And I remember it well. And I would climb up onto the step on the counter and I would watch. And he had a, a set of scales. Can you believe this? He had a set of scales on the counter. And I used to love to watch it. It just kind of fascinated me as a, as a five and six year old child. And he would pour the rice or the sugar or the flour or whatever it was into one side. And then he had these little weights. I loved these weights. And I loved, I loved watching him put them in. And I was just kind of fascinated with him just getting it to the right weight. And then you'd see the, the, the rice or the flour or the sugar, you'd see it coming up or oh, a bit more, a bit more. And he'd just get it. And then he would charge you the money. Now, when Paul says walk worthy, he's saying this. Your practice should weigh 
as much as your profession. You should have a balanced life. You say you believe all this stuff. You believe that you're saved. You believe you've been forgiven. You believe that you're a saint. You believe that Christ is the son of God. You believe that you're going to be in heaven one day. You believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You be Does it look like that on Monday morning? Does that have any weight? Or is it just top heavy with all this cerebral stuff? You're a theology major, but you can't live with your wife. You can't. Uh, be civil at work no says the apostle paul your practice should weigh as much as your profession you know these these ephesians it's, it's great to be able to go back to the book of acts and find out the background to some of these epistles what were these ephesians like they were idolaters they were wicked evil people they used to be uh devotees of various gods there was a temple in Ephesus, remember, Diana of the Ephesians, Artemis of the Ephesians, and they would cry out for hours on end, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You get this description of them at the beginning of chapter two, dead, disobedient, depraved, a whole bunch of Ds. You can preach on them many a time in the gospel. Verse four of chapter two, but God, God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead he didn't wait for us to clean our act up he loved us even when we were dead he has quickened us with christ then you come to verse eight for by grace this is what the ephesians had come into the good of grace Saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. This was their appreciation. Do you know someone who understands grace? Someone who really understands grace would never in a million years ever say, oh, that means I can live as I like. Let me explain to you why. In California some years ago, there was a school teacher doing a project with her children on John Newton, the English uh, slave trader who then became a minister of the gospel. He's actually buried not far from here in Northamptonshire. And so uh, the teacher was telling her children away there in California about John Newton. And of course, she couldn't do that without dealing with his hymn, Amazing Grace. And as she looked at the hymn Amazing Grace and thought about telling it to the children, she noticed this terrible word in verse one, wretch. Amazing Grace has sweet the same sound that saved a wretch like me. And she thought that's a bit harsh, a bit old fashioned. I'll just change it. So she changed it to Amazing Grace has sweet the sound that saved a man like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, I was blind, but now I see. So that was fine. The children all wrote this down and and one girl took this homework home or this project home and her mum was looking at it and said that's not right where did you get that from oh well, teacher said so she said that's not what it says the, the, the hymn says amazing grace and sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i'm gonna have a word with that teacher so she went and had a word with the teacher and she said why did you change why did you change this word wretch to man? Well, the teacher said, you know, it's, it's a little bit harsh and it's not politically correct. And, you know, I didn't want the children to be negative, you know, the way it is in the modern world. And the mother said, listen, the whole point of the hymn is the fact that he was a wretch. And the first two words of the hymn, amazing grace, are only amazing because of the wretchedness of John Newton. And the reason he wrote not just about grace, but the reason he wrote about amazing grace is because of the depths of sin from which he was rescued. And when you understand the grace of God, when you understand what you deserve, when you understand that you are a lost and guilty sinner and you've been saved by grace, you want to please the Lord that saved you. Grace leads 
to godliness. If, if grace means you think I can do as I like, you don't understand grace. In fact, there are people in the Bible and they twisted the grace of God. You may remember a verse in, in Jude, verse 4. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, which is a, a, a rather old-fashioned word. But what, they, what it's doing is this. It's saying, oh, the grace of God, that's fine, I'm saved, all is well. I can now use that as a license for promiscuity. Now, that is actually done by some people today. Maybe not in quite such an overt way, but maybe you've met Christians who will say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to drink. I, I, I'm happy to go to nightclubs. I'm happy to, to do the lottery. I'm under grace. You say, well, I've never met anybody like that. Well, OK, you can thank the Lord for that. But I have. I've met people who claim to be Christians and they do a whole bunch of things that Christians never used to do. And when you sort of raise that as a matter of discussion, it's now flattened because of grace. Oh, you're just under law. I'm under grace. But the Bible expects grace to lead to godliness. And we'll see that even more clearly when we come to our next book. So if you wouldn't mind, please turn to Titus and we'll look there in chapter two. Titus chapter two. So in Romans, justification leads to sanctification. In Ephesians, grace leads to godliness. In Titus, doctrine leads to duty. Just keeping my eye on the time here. See, we have about 15 minutes left. Doctrine leads to duty. The Cretans, if, if, the, if the Ephesians were bad boys, the Cretans may be worse. The Cretans had notoriously low morals. They were a bad bunch. Uh, in fact, there was a Greek word, kretidzo. You see the link between kretidzo and the Cretans. Kretidzo means to tell lies. And their patron god, Zeus, he, he uh, of course, he doesn't really exist, but, but the, the myths surrounding him are all about lies and adultery and so on. They were saved, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, through a God who cannot lie. And as Paul writes these three chapters, he, he's telling Titus, who's serving the Lord in Crete, chapter 1, there's a need for godly leaders in the assembly. Chapter 2, there's a need for godly saints in the home. Chapter 3, there's a need for godly citizens in society. Now, when he comes to the home... And when it comes to society, what motivation does he give them? Well, let's have a look. Chapter two, verse one, he starts talking about, well, verse two, old men. Verse three, old women. Verse four, young women. Verse six, young men. Verse nine, servants. Let me have that verse in 10 about adorning the doctrine. Then look at verse 11. What does it begin with? Four. So he says, this is what you should do if you're a young person, if you're an old person, if you're a man or a woman. These are the things you should do. Now, here's why you should do them. For the grace of God that brings salvation. Here he's making the link. He's making the link between salvation, doctrine, that which is positional, that which we believe, that which we know, and how we live if we're young men or young women or older men or older women and so on. The grace of God has brought salvation. Now listen to verse 12. This is a verse you need next time you meet someone that says, I can do as I like because of grace. The grace of God that brings salvation, verse 12, teaching us. Grace has got something to teach us. It's going to teach us something negative. It's going to teach us something positive. Negatively, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldliness. Grace teaches you to say no to certain things. Grace does. Grace is not a license. Grace is a truth. And grace teaches us to say no to certain things. Then grace teaches us to say yes to living soberly and righteously and godly. Then in verse 14, that's why Christ died for us, to purify unto himself a special people. Grace doesn't mean I can do as I like. Grace means I want to do what he likes. And then you come to chapter three. What's chapter three about? Well, if you look at the first couple of verses, 
I'll summarize them very briefly. Obey the government and be a good neighbor. That's the first two verses of chapter three. Obey the government and be a good neighbor. What is the motivation for obeying the government and being a good neighbor? Verse three, four. We ourselves were sometimes foolish, but verse four, the kindness and love of God our Savior has appeared. Now that word uh, love is not the normal word for love. I know there's always debates about filio and agapeo and so on. This is the word from which we get our English word philanthropy. Philanthropy. Why does he use an obscure word like philanthropy when he's talking about God loving us? What he's doing is this. He's saying God has been philanthropic. Phil, love, anthropos, man. God has showed man kindness. God has been philanthropic to sinners in Crete. He saved them. Now he says, you be philanthropic to your next door neighbor. You be philanthropic in society. What's he doing? He's showing this link between salvation, between doctrine, between what I believe, what I say I believe, and how I live in society, how I live with my next door neighbor. So, to put it in very practical terms, I cannot claim to really understand or appreciate the kindness of God to me if I am the worst neighbor in my street. If I refuse to pay my taxes, if I cheat the benefit system, if I'm not a good member of society, if I'm not a good neighbor, I'm basically saying, thank you, Lord, for being kind and philanthropic to me. I'm going to be a pain in the neck in society. Can you see what we're driving at here as we come down the straight to our last couple of points? The Bible is not allowing us to simply view salvation as some kind of a theory. Oh, that's the way you get to heaven. Good, sorted that one, tick that box, and then I live my life for myself. <laughs> I'm a Christian, but I really live as an atheist. A lot of people doing that today, but that's not possible. That's not biblical. Romans won't let you do it. Ephesians won't let you do it. Titus won't let you do it. Come over to James, please. James and chapter 2. James says in verse 14 of chapter 2, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can that kind of faith save him? Are you still with me now? I know this is point number four and perhaps we're getting a bit tired. Justification must lead to sanctification, says Paul in Romans. Grace must lead to godliness, says Paul in Ephesians. Doctrine must lead to duty in Titus. Now he says, James says here, Faith must lead to good works. A profession of faith that is devoid of righteous works cannot be called salvation, no matter how strongly you might proclaim it. Now, of course, we need to be careful, very, very careful, how we delineate the relationship between faith and works. I met recently, two weeks ago, a Tridentine Roman Catholic, a traditional Roman Catholic. He actually had a copy of the Council of Trent in his rucksack. If you don't know what the Council of Trent is, well, you can look that up after the meeting. He believed the Mass should be said in Latin, etc. He was only 17, but a very bright lad indeed. He told me that he believed in uh, faith and grace and Jesus. Uh, he believed, he said, that the blood of Christ was sufficient to cleanse every sin. And at first blush, you might have thought, wow, maybe he's a believer. But of course, he wasn't. And as we probed into what he believed, he believed that salvation is faith plus works. The blood of Christ is sufficient as long as I cooperate and go to confession and do and so on, so on, so forth. So the religious world teaches that salvation is faith plus works. Then you have these false teachers that we've read about in the Bible, and there are some of them alive today. They don't so much teach that salvation is faith plus works. They say salvation is faith and who cares about works? 
the more you sin, the better. Both of those views are entirely misleading and entirely wrong. You say, well, what does the Bible teach here in the, in the epistle of James? The Bible teaches this. Salvation is faith that works. So the works don't contribute to salvation. A Christian doesn't do good works in order to be saved. A Christian does good works because he is saved. See, what James is trying to undermine is the kind of idea that faith is just mental assent. Well, I, I believe. I'm a believer. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he rose again from the dead. I believe there's a heaven and there's a hell. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe all those things. Tick, 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 tick. That's not salvation. He uses a very powerful argument in verse 19. He says the devils also believe. And he goes on to talk about Rahab and Abraham. You say, why does he talk about them? Because they were both believers. And yet their lives evidenced faith. James is telling these people there must be evidence. There must be fruit if there's a root. Now, some people have a struggle uh, tallying up James and Romans because in Romans, faith without works is commended. But then in James, faith without works is condemned. And you think, well, well, which is it? Well, the reason is this. Romans is telling you how to get saved, whereas James is telling you how salvation is evidenced. Romans is saying works cannot save you. James is saying works vindicate your profession of salvation so james is saying the same as paul said in romans in ephesians in titus he's saying exactly the same thing faith must lead to works now finally come with me to first john we'll have five minutes on first john if Romans tells us that justification leads to sanctification and Ephesians tells us that grace leads to godliness and Titus tells us that doctrine leads to duty and James tells us the same thing in different words, that faith leads to good works. What does 1 John tell us? 1 John tells us that the new birth must lead to new behavior. Now, if you look up the word born in your uh, whatever way you search your Bible, you'll find the new birth is mentioned in every chapter in 1 John except chapter 1. So there's a high emphasis, a heavy emphasis on the new birth, receiving life and the evidence of that life in 1 John. Now, in chapter 1, even though he doesn't mention the new birth, you probably have the clearest expression of this disconnect that I've been talking about all evening ever found in the word of God. Let's read it together in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Can you see John making the same distinction as Paul and James? He's saying if we say this, if we profess this doctrine, this truth, this salvation, this is what we believe. We say that we have fellowship. But if we actually walk, walk there just being another word for the daily Christian life. If we walk in darkness, well, then we're just telling lies. That's a disconnect that's not allowed. If we say, it's a bit like the Lord in Matthew 7, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. Or in James 2, the, we have a description there. If a man says he has faith. Come over to chapter 3. We'll finish in chapter 3. Now, the way the Apostle John operates is not like Paul. Paul does one block and then block two. But the Apostle John goes in series and cycles. And so he cycles through this theme. So we're not going to be able to look at one particular place. But he visits this theme in chapter 3 and verse 9. Listen, whoever, what, uh, whatsoever is born of God, 
that means born again, born from above, does not commit or practice sin. Doesn't mean you will never ever commit a sin. We know that from chapter two, that you will, that I will. But what he's saying is this, a person who is born again cannot live a life of unhindered, willful, habitual sin. For his seed remaineth in him. There's some dispute about what that means, but I would be fairly satisfied that he's talking about the new nature that we receive when we are saved. So because of that new nature within us, because of what has been wrought and begotten within us, then we cannot be as we were before. He cannot continue committing sin as a lifestyle because he's been born again. In fact, he says in verse 10, this is the manifesting feature of what's the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. One lives a righteous life and the other one doesn't. So the bottom line here is the same as before. Salvation makes a change. It transforms people. You say, well, I was saved when I was young. Well, maybe so. I was saved when I was fairly young too, 14. But salvation makes a change. And, and, and the salvation changes that are made, sometimes they're not the most obvious things. You know, sometimes we think, oh, so-and-so is reading his Bible. And he goes to a lot of meetings. Well, that's all wonderful. Great. We need to read our Bibles and we need to go to meetings. But the new birth changes a person's disposition. And there are, there are marks of interest in spiritual things. There are marks of daily sanctification and holiness that begin to show those green shoots in an early time of a newborn Christian's life. And when I was, uh, when we had smaller children, they're, they're grown up now, but when they were small, uh, back in those days, you had a cassette player in your car. You remember those days? That seems like a whole lifetime ago. A cassette player. And you would put these cassettes in. Sometimes the machine would chew them up and then you were in a bad way. But anyway, uh, when they were small, they would be in the back seat. And in an attempt to keep them quiet, we would play a cassette. Well, of course, you have to find things that children are interested in. Some, sometimes we had Sunday school choruses. Uh, but we found this. We found this uh, Christian program that had sort of songs and stories on it. It was called Patch the Pirate. I'm sure you can still get it. It's probably freely available on YouTube or something. You'll all be looking for it after this meeting. Patch the Pirate. Well, we went all over the country listening to Patch the Pirate. Episode one and episode 21 and on we went. I don't know how many tapes we got through. And some of these songs are very catchy. And uh, they're still with me to this day. And there was one song, I don't remember what episode it was, but it stuck. And it was about the new birth. Quite repetitive. Maybe that's why it stuck. But the first verse went like this. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. And it would repeat that three times. And then it would say, there's been a great change since I've been born again. And then there was a chorus. There's been a great change and so on. Verse two. The things I used to say, I don't say them anymore, and so on and so forth. And then it would say, uh, verse three, the songs I used to sing, I don't sing them anymore. Well, you get the idea. You know, I think there was some powerful truth in that very, very simple song. You know, we, we can discuss the new birth, and there's a lot to discuss. And the Bible has five different words for it. And it's all slightly different angles and so on. The new birth is a big, big, big subject. But the bottom line is this. When someone is born again, that new birth must lead to new behavior. Because if I've been born of God and I have the life of God in me, then the songs I used to sing, I don't sing them anymore. And the words I used to say, I don't say them anymore. And the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. This is what the Bible expects. 
England expects every man will do his duty. The Bible expects that justification will lead to sanctification. The Bible expects that grace will lead to godliness. The Bible expects that doctrine will be manifested in Christian duty. The Bible expects that faith will lead to good works. And here in 1 John, the Bible expects that the new birth will lead to new behaviour. Well, I hope that's not been too long or too complicated or too many verses. I trust that the central theme has got through and will be a blessing to each one of us this evening.